Okay, here we go. All right, we're ready. <clears throat> so tell me about this. Well, the first thing you notice is the uh, tail call sign. It says UP. That means the airplane is up. Uh, but every base had its own <laughs> unique two-letter identification. And UP here is from Korea, Kunsan, Korea. It's 1974. And I am using an 8-millimeter camera. Those 49, 45 years ago at the... Uh, take off into the runway at Kunsan. And I guess there's no audio, but uh, I liked it out there because of all of the noise they made. And, and you can see all the smoke here. Those J79 jet engines uh, put out a ton of smoke. Uh, the bad part was uh, if you were fighting uh, the enemy, they could see you coming from about two or three miles away just from the smoke trail. And the when you have it in an afterburner, the afterburner burns up the smoke. So you can make the smoke disappear, but you have to be an afterburner. And then you're using all your gas, and then you run out of gas and don't have enough to come home. So we always use the afterburner uh, for takeoff. You never did a takeoff without afterburner. But once you got up to about 100 feet in the air, or a little more, you pull it out of afterburner so you wouldn't run out of gas. Are those all fuel tanks hanging off the bottom there? Yes, those are two external 370-gallon fuel tanks. You could also carry a large centerline fuel tank that carried more fuel than those two put together if you needed it. Is that the D model? F4? Yes, those are F4 D models. That means that there was no internal gun, no internal cannon, 20 mic mic. The E model had a longer nose, which accommodated the internal cat. Now, you see that smoke after they came out of afterburner? It's great for uh, joining up on, on lead. You, you know, you can easily see where the lead airplane is, just follow the smoke. Now, these have a different tail sign, is that? These are from George Air Force Base. And yeah, it's a different, and that's the Sierra Nevada Mountains under the tank. Is there. that the Black Sheep logo there? No, that's the attack, tactical air command uh, shield there. This this is in Southern California, Victorville, California is where we flew out of. <laughs> I forget what lake that is. Must be wintertime because there's snow in the Sierras. G-A. And then the first little two letters after that, those two numbers rather, under the big fat letters, that's the year that airplane was built. So that was 63 something something something, tail number. But the first two numbers, the small ones, on all Air Force airplanes, that's the year it was built. Now you guys were in pretty tight formation there earlier. Was that normal to fly that tight? Yeah, that was kind of a normal spread uh, for a four flight. Here we are coming up under somebody to join up. I'm not sure what we're doing. I think we were learning to fly a formation there. <laughs> now that's a spread formation. This is a lookout formation. You, you're pretty much lying abreast in your you know, like uh, a thousand feet apart. That gives you the ability to take your eyes off of the lead airplane, where if you're in close formation, you're staring at the lead airplane. You don't take your eyes off of him. But if you spread out like that, then you can look around and... Oh, look at that, there's another one down there. There's a four ship going out at lower altitude over the desert. Now we're coming in. This is still George Air Force Base. And we're getting ready to do a pitch out. So you get all four airplanes echeloned. And the runway is, is on the left. And so the lead airplane will rock his wings up 45 degrees. And then the next airplane counts eight seconds. And then he does a break. And the third airplane waits eight more seconds. He does a break. Now we're on the downwind. Everybody's done their break. And 
Or that's the brake right there, excuse me. Yeah, so here we are. We're braking now. Oh, you're right over the runway. Yeah, it was a dual runway. Now we're, we're, we're turning final. And now this guy is on final, and we're still in final turn. And it's getting kind of bumpy, as it does over the desert when it starts to heat up. And there's the end of the runway. What is that coming out the back of the plane? That's a little uh, fuel being vented out for one reason or another. You can also dump fuel if you need to get your weight down to land right after takeoff. You, you can take off at max gross weight, which was about, I think that airplane weighed 58,000 pounds. It's about 65 feet long and about a 37 foot wingspan, I think. It's been a long time. See the big numbers, number 625, that's the tail number. And in front of that, that's the year it was built. But if you have to land right after takeoff, you would probably jettison those external tanks and you'd start dumping the internal fuel because you want to weigh as little as possible if you're doing an emergency landing. Otherwise, you got to be going so fast because you're so heavy that you uh, might run out of runway. Although the F-4 had a tail hook on it. And uh, at most runways, they had the option to put up the barrier, the cable. And if that was put in place and tower notified, you could come in and take the hook and land just like on an aircraft carrier, except the runway wouldn't be pitching and rolling. <laughs> but it was used commonly in Southeast Asia uh, during the monsoon season when the runways had standing water on them. Uh, we would often take the hook because if you catch the airplane, there's no chance of it hydroplaning off the runway later because of the water. That seems like a dangerous maneuver because if, if the lead plane turns back to the right, he's going to smack the guy underneath him if he's not paying attention, huh? Yeah, you don't want to have some ham fist up there. You got to be pretty smooth when you're flying the lead. Okay, so there we are doing an aileron roll at the top of a cloud. And... Uh, I remember this day, and here comes somebody, we're going to film them doing an aileron roll. I think this is a Holloman, yeah. I think I was flying with Paul Dombrowski, and we're talking on the radio, so we were telling him, you know, do an aileron roll, and we'll have the camera running. Pretty sure this is Holloman. Those look it, like New Mexico clouds. <laughs> if you see HO on the vertical stabilizer on the tail, that means it's a Holloman airplane. Okay, there goes another aileron roll close to the clouds. Okay, this guy's just flying inverted now. <laughs> <laughs> that is like extremely uncomfortable when you're doing it, but it looks kind of neat. Oh, these the are Thunderbirds. The Thunderbirds when they were flying the F-4. And this is taken at uh, Warner Robins, Georgia. I was on alert. I was flying B-52s out of Warner Robins, Georgia, where David Murphy was born in 1970. And my mom and dad were visiting us at the base. And that's a formation roll of the Thunderbirds. So the year here would have been, hmm, gee, 1970. or Yeah, this would have been 1970. He's on the deck at a high rate of speed. It goes inverted, comes back around, pulls up hard because he scared himself right there. Yeah, this was on a summer day in July in 1969 or 70. I, I don't know if David had been born yet or not. Because I signed in there in 69. Uh, 
and had my first arc light mission that's overseas during Vietnam when we flew out of Guam and Okinawa and Thailand and we were gone for six months on a TDY. That was about the time that man landed on the moon. I was on alert on that July night in 1969 when I was in the alert facility and Neil Armstrong stepped down onto the moon about two or three o'clock in the morning, East Coast time. And we were all watching. Okay, this is a aerial, aerial refueling. This is from the F-4 perspective. That's a KC-135 tanker. There's a guy laying down on his belly in the back of that airplane and he's the boom operator and he flies the boom up and down and back and forth. So here comes the F-4 getting into pre-contact position. And the F-4 pilot needs to fly up and basically fly formation on the tanker and once he gets in position then the boom operator who can also extend the boom as well as maneuver it left and right and up and down he can shoot it in and out if you get in position then he actually flies the receptacle the the hose into your receptacle which is right behind the back seater's head which is where I was so I was always anxious as I saw that boom coming just a couple of feet above my head at about 300 knots, probably close to 400 miles an hour, I'd guess. Okay, now behind the second white helmet right there, the white dot, that's the receptacle. So there's the backseater looking at it. He's literally crouching down. <laughs> yeah, he's getting he's a good look at it there. And there he goes, he sticks him. All right, you're stuck. Now he's locked in there and he's taking on gas. I forget the transfer rate, but it didn't take long. Within about three minutes, you could, three or four minutes, you know, you had a full load of gas again. And this is UP, so this is a Kunsan airplane again here. Is this during the war? No, no I know. Uh, I was in Kunsan in 74, and uh, I was in Vietnam in F-4s in 72 for six months. We, we took all of our airplanes from Holloman, all 24 airplanes and 24 air crews and uh, six tankers, and we flew across the Pacific. We landed the first night in Hawaii, the second night in Guam, and the third night we were in Thailand. Okay, GA, this was back at George Air Base in 1971. In the early part of 71, it took six months to go through training for the F-4, and uh, the last half of 71, we were at Holloman. Would you deliberately avoid those big cumulus clouds like that? Yeah, you know, uh, some clouds are fun to fly through, but not the big, strong, puffy ones like that. That's a cumulus cloud, and there's updrafts in there. It won't hurt the airplane necessarily, but it's rough, and it if it turns out that it's more developed than you thought it was, there could be ice in there and hail and electricity called lightning. So we particularly didn't like flying into them at night. But when you're in, when you're in Southeast Asia and you're coming home at night, sometimes those thunder clouds would go up as high as 60,000 feet with all kinds of nasty weather inside. What was the highest you ever went in that airplane? The highest 
I ever went in that airplane was uh, below 60,000 feet. If you flew, uh, oh, this was back in Kunsan, Korea, about sunset. To fly above 60,000 feet, you had to have a, a partial pressure suit on. And uh, the reason is because the air is so thin up there, if you lost cabin pressurization, your time of useful consciousness was extremely short, like you know, less than 10 seconds, which means that you, you could pass out. Even if you had your oxygen mask on, at that altitude, you have to do a thing called pressure breathing. So normally at sea level, like or 2,000 or 5,000 feet, when you relax, air comes into your lungs. You don't have to work to suck air in. It just happens. You have to, you can blow it out and suck it in. But for the most part, it's a neutral transaction. You breathe in, you breathe out. But when you're at 50 or 60,000 feet, you have to pressure breathe, which means they force the oxygen into your long, lungs and it fills up like that. And then now you got to, you have to forcefully blow the air out to create enough pressure in your lungs for the oxygen to transfer into your bloodstream. And you're breathing backwards. And when you do that for a long period of time, it wears you out because you're not, you don't normally use those muscles. It'd be like you spent your whole day blowing up balloons. You'd be tired at the end of the day. But the highest I ever went in F4 was a little over 50,000 feet. And I did that as we zoomed up because we were getting ready to do a Mach 2 run. And the airplane would do Mach 2.5. And so there was really no need to ever go that fast. <laughs> I mean, really, in your operational requirement, there's no need to go Mach 2, but we all wanted to do it just to see what it sounded like. And uh, so we went up to 50,000 feet and pulled inverted and put the afterburner in and went downhill from a high altitude in afterburner. And that's how you get up to two and a half times the speed of sound. And really, if you didn't have a meter there telling you that, you wouldn't even know it. It was very smooth. It's quiet, supersonic. You don't really realize it when you're going through it. There, People on the ground probably are. Were there rules about flying supersonic? Because you know nowadays you can't fly over per certain parts of the country. Because yeah, you are even out here at Nellis. Well, we're not in Nellis now. We're in Albuquerque. But yeah, you don't you don't fly supersonic over populated areas. You're not supposed to, anyway. It's a pretty sharp turn you guys are in there. Yeah, that's George Air Base again. This airplane would, uh, there's not a lot of airplanes that'll go supersonic on the deck, but this is one of them. You can do like, 800 miles an hour indicated airspeed and afterburner on the deck in a good plane. And the speed of sound is like about 760 or something. Oh, this is, that's the little island off of Kunsan there on the runway. And that's the, oh, that's the Yellow Sea over on the left. You go that way uh, about 300 miles and you're in China. Go the other direction, you end up in Japan. Oh, that's the same base, huh? Mm -hmm. That's a dormant volcano in the southern part of Korea. Wow. Burning off some of the rice fields there. We're fairly low there. We're probably lower than we should be, but... That reminds me of Diamond Head, Hawaii right there, but that's the very southern tip of Korea. Uh, here we are flying over the water. It was fun to get down really low over the water, but it was, it was scary. There's a boat and it was kind of intoxicating. Uh, I remember going with Paul Cotto one time. I don't think this was it, but we got down pretty darn low 
I didn't like it because your depth perception is not that good when you're going that fast, that low. I always made sure I wore my brown pants on the day we did that. All right, now we're upside down. Just uh, the mountains are on top. Those are not clouds. It's amazing how disoriented you can get, particularly at night when there's no lights on the ground, or even if there are, because you can't tell if there's stars or ground lights. And you can't tell up from down, like now we're upside down. And here we come back right. No, see, I got confused just looking at it. <laughs> So you, you rely on these things called instruments to tell you what your attitude is, how fast you're going, how high you are, how quickly you're going up or down. And somehow we cheated death again that day and we're back at the base getting ready to land. Terra firma. <laughs> this was before the days of smartphones. I mean, well, you I'm carrying this together, right? I'm carrying a, a super eight millimeter handheld camera in the cockpit, doing this with no image stabil stabilization and no auto-focus or auto-exposure or anything else. You don't really land the F-4, you just fly it into the ground. You just, <laughs> there's no flare, really. There's no, you know, you just get a rate of descent, you get the nose up, you get a sink rate going, and then once you got that nailed, you just keep flying it like that till you feel the wheels hit the yeah, ground. Yeah, it really does just sort of touch down. And then huh? you got a drag chute. They don't have drag chutes anymore. Not with the modern airplanes. They got other ways of slowing it down. Plus they don't land as fast. The technology is so much better. But this contributes to your turnaround time. If you pull the drag chute every time you land, somebody's got to go out, collect the chute and repack it and put it back in the airplane before you can take off again. Here's our final turn to landing. And this is what it looks like from the back seat. You could land the airplane from the back seat. You had all the throttles and controls you needed, but the visibility was kind of poor. So you're looking over the shoulder of the guy in the front of you, and you don't have a real good view of the runway. I was lucky. I got, I got to fly the airplane a lot uh, when we were in Vietnam with the Holloman outfit, because my front seater had had a tour in the back seat when they had pilots in both seats. They ran out of pilots, so they started putting navigators in the back seat, which is how I ended up in the back seat, because there was a shortage of pilots. Look at that. That's you. Everybody thinks that's me, but that's a guy named Keith Cottle. In the he's, back? Yeah, he's almost as good looking as I really? am. Really? Yeah. That's uh, not, I always thought that was you. A, a lot of people do, and we do look alike, but that's not me. That's I'm taking the movie, and Keith is the guy that's lucky enough to look like me. Wow, that just blows my mind. Who's this guy? Oh, gosh, with the mustache. I can't read his name tag, and I can't remember his name. It's been too many years ago. This was his last flight. This is George Barr. And when you have your last flight, they meet you with champagne and they hose you down. I think that's the end of that movie. So let's see. Um, when exactly were you in Vietnam? I was there the first time in 1970. I think I was, I left in like April and got back in October, I think. 
and it was a, a TDY, temporary duty. That was that was when I was a navigator on the B-52. And so we were stationed in Warner Robins, Georgia, and we got sent on temporary duty to uh, fly arc light missions, which were uh, high-altitude bombing in Vietnam. And uh, we spent roughly a third of our time on the island of Guam and a third on the island of Okinawa, which many people will recognize from World War XI. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's a joke, folks. Uh, that was a joke. And then the last part of that was at uh, the southern end of Thailand, a base called Utapau. The town near Utapau was Sadaheep. And so <laughs> <Sada Heap. laughs> we could we could go into town from Utapau to Sadaheep along the way. And uh, if you were hungry, they always had barbecued dog and you could eat, eat some dog. Did you ever eat any dog? No. No. <laughs> Are you kidding? Kill you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was quite the experience. Uh, the, uh, the weather there was really hot. We lived in uh, little metal trailers, four of us in a little trailer, and there were two bunk beds. And I slept on the upper bunk, bunk bed on this side, and there were two other guys over here and somebody below me. And uh, on the ceiling, which was about a foot above my face, uh, I had my own personal little gecko. And uh, I was always glad to see him because they ate mosquitoes. So they were nice to have around. And so you didn't want to scare off your gecko or kill him or anything like that. And uh, we were there during the rainy season. And it, a lot of times we were flying at night. And so we would go out, get on the crew bus. It's just 100% humidity. And you go out and it's pouring down rain, and we would get off the bus and walk under the wing of that big B-52 to stay dry, and either the pilot or the co-pilot would draw straws to see who was going to do the walk around out in the rain with the flashlight to see if the tail was still on the airplane and the flight controls were working. And in the process, you were guaranteed to get soaking wet drenched. And uh, then you'd crawl back up in the airplane and you'd fire that puppy up and turn the air conditioners on and it would get cold. And there's nothing like being cold and wet at the same time. And so I used to carry in my briefcase bag, I used to carry a towel with me. And I would take that, I'd keep that towel dry in my briefcase until I got inside the airplane and knew that we weren't going to go back out. And then I would towel off to get dry so I would be a little more comfortable during the flight. And uh, the thing I remember about uh, being out on the ramp with, you know, 100 B-52s and the buses driving you to yours and you're taking off in three ship cells, and so everything is all coordinated, and the radios are crackling, and, and you're riding your bus out there trying to find your airplane in the dark. You know, it's and the bus driver was a Thai national, and uh, the, the bus driver would carry with him a plastic Ziploc bag, even though we didn't have Ziploc bags, and there was a plastic bag nonetheless, about a, a half gallon size. And what, what the Thais would do, is they'd run out and pick up the live rice bugs off of the tarmac. And the, these large bugs that were probably three or four inches long, they looked like big old crawdads or something. They were ugly. But they would eat rice that had blown onto the runway. And um, then it would be in their stomach, and as it became partially digested, it was considered a delicacy by the locals. So they would catch these bugs, put them in a plastic bag, and they're in their side crawling around. And then they would reach in there as they're driving the bus, 
and they would take one, and snap its head off, and take the body of it and squeeze it, and squeeze that digested rice into their mouth, and it was a delicacy. And then they'd throw the carcass away of the rice bug. Whoa, that's crazy. So we used to challenge each other to try it. <laughs> and I, I just couldn't bring myself to try one. I, I passed on the rice bugs. But that's what I remember about being in Utapau, Thailand in the summer of 1970. So how often would you guys go out and fly missions that we were dropping bombs and stuff? We flew in the B-52s, we flew like, I'm going to say an average of about three times a week. About three missions a week. When we were flying from Vietnam, it was probably twice a week because uh, that was a long flight. That was... That was a 12-hour flight, six hours over and six hours back. And being in that old airplane for 12 hours uh, took some recuperating time. We would take off fully loaded with fuel and bombs. The B-52 would carry a total of 127 500-pound bombs. Uh, the B-52 was designed to be a nuclear bomber and uh, to fly at high altitude. The first B-52 flew in 1952 and it was operational by 1955 or 6. Uh, they stopped building the latest ones, the newest ones, in 1961. The last ones to be built were called H models and they had fan jet engines. The B-52 has eight engines. Its gross takeoff weight is 488,000 pounds. And it took a long runway, with, even with eight engines, uh, particularly if you had the earlier model B-52s, which did not have fan jets. They just had regular jets, whatever the difference is. The fans, I know, it gets more air and they have a bigger cowl, and you can tell them visually apart. And they have a shorter tail, but uh, it was a long takeoff roll. And at Anderson Air Base, Guam, I was really excited to go there because my father was stationed at Guam in World War II. He was there, uh, and his job was guarding Japanese prisoners. And he took a lot of photographs and brought home a lot of stuff in his sea chest and, and his old uniform and some jewelry he had made and so I had seen pictures of Guam since I was a young boy and I had looked it up on the map and I knew where it was and I, I found it really weird that 25 years after my father was there, I was there on the same island, on the same runway and flying out of there in V-52s as the navigator. And now I'm having a hard time believing that that was almost 50 years ago. That was 1970. We're sitting here in 2019. So next year when you turn 50, it'll be 50 years ago that I was on the same island in a war that my father had been in 25 years earlier in uh, 1945, is that, is that the right math? 45 to 70 is 25 years. So there you go. The runway at Anderson was high on each end <laughs> and it was low in the middle, which made it kind of nice for a B-52 because you can get more speed up going downhill than you can uphill. So about halfway through this takeoff roll, which takes about a full minute, in a commercial airliner, when you, you check it today, when you get on an airliner and you take off somewhere, the takeoff rolls about 30 seconds, give or take five seconds either way on any kind of airplane, 30 seconds. Well, we had a, about a one minute takeoff roll. And at Anderson Air Base on Guam, you started up and you were going down, which was a good thing. But then the last 30 seconds, you're going slightly uphill, like probably less than one half of 1% of a grade. But you know what? That's noticeable in an airplane. And so now you're motoring 
slightly uphill and trying to get that old hog off. And the nice part about it was when you take off, you take off of a cliff that's about 200 feet high. So when you get to the end of the runway, if you haven't lifted off yet, you just left the throttles to the firewall because you knew you had about 200 feet of altitude before you'd hit the water. And so you might have to sometimes go ahead and you didn't ever take off, you just ran off the end of the runway at full throttle. And that big old beast would settle down a little bit and shake and groan and moan. And slowly but surely, she'd start to pick up some altitude and you were on your way. And that airplane is still flying today. This is May the something 16th, Christy's birthday. Hi, Christy. Uh, and uh, it's scheduled to stay in the service until the mid-2050s, which means that airplane is going to be about 100 years old and still on active duty in the United States Air Force, the finest air force in the world. Can you believe that? A hundred years? That airplane was old when I was in it. There have been five generations fly that airplane. If you figure 20 years per generation and five generations, that means that your great-great-grandfather could have flown that airplane if you're, if you're just now entering the population. It's incredible. So that was the first tour, and then you went. You did a second tour, and actually, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna reset this. This camera will only run for 30 minutes at a time. So before okay. you, so let me just reset this real quick. And uh, okay, you can resume. So yeah, that that second second yeah, tour. We, we came home uh, from that one, and uh, at that point, uh, I was pretty dissatisfied with my situation in the Air Force, and I, uh, at that time, I, I did not enjoy flying in the B-52 because if you were a navigator on the B-52, you had no windows. You sat on the lower deck. There were six crew members on the B-52, a pilot, a co-pilot upstairs in the front. They need to see where they're going. I understand that. But then downstairs in the bowels on the deck, was the navigator and the radar navigator. The radar navigator you'd probably call the bombardier because that's what he did with the radar. And then upstairs again, but facing aft, right above the, the navigators, but facing backwards were the EW, the electronic warfare officer, and the gunner. Now in the very first B-52s, the gunner literally sat back in the tail. He was by himself at the very back end of the airplane. And he got in from the back end with a ladder. And uh, in the newer airplanes, they moved the gunner inside the, the cabin. And so he had remote control of those four fifty caliber guns that were fired from the tail still, but he operated them from inside the, the cabin with everybody else. Um, everybody else had an ejection seat that went up. Um, the navigator and the radar navigator, our rejection seats fired down. Now, when you think about it, uh, if you are getting, getting shot down, you need more altitude to survive the ejection than the guys that are getting fired up when they eject. So in order for that ejection seat, which was very uncomfortable, in order for it to work, you had to, A, you had to be strapped in. You had to be strapped, and this is not like having your seatbelt fastened on an airline flight. Oh, no. You had these over-the-shoulder harnesses, and you had a spacer on the bottom of the back that would hold the weight of the parachute, which probably weighed 20, 25 pounds. And as the years went by, those cushions got more and more compressed, and the straps got tighter, and... There was no way to be comfortable and be strapped in as securely as you needed to be with your lap belt fastened uh, and their handle between your legs. So if you had to eject, you reached down between your legs and you grabbed the handle. And you, you had to have 400 feet minimum altitude above the ground in order to have room for your parachute to open. 
Now this was uh, not a problem when they originally built the airplane because as I mentioned, it was conceived as a high altitude bomber. But as warfare changed, uh, and it was built to fly over the North Pole into Russia and drop bombs in Russia. But as Russia got more and more sophisticated radars, we had to change our strategy. And so we'd fly up to the North Pole at altitude but when we got ready to fly over Finland and that part and go down and penetrate the Russian airspace, we had to be really low to be under their radar so they wouldn't know we're coming. So the profile called for us to be flying at an altitude of 200 feet. And you're sitting in an ejection seat that needs 400 feet to function. Now what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> At any rate, I digress. I was not happy flying in that airplane because the best way I can describe flying in a B-52 if you were the navigator or the radar operator would be like if you went into your house and got in the closet and closed the door and turned the vacuum cleaner on <laughs> and turned all the lights out. That's pretty much what it was like flying in, in the bowels of the B-52. <laughs> so when I got back from that mission, from that expedition, that first tour, I really had enjoyed all I could stand of the B-52. And besides that, people made fun of it. It was called the Buff, the B-U-F-F, -F. Big Ugly F-F. -F. I'll let you figure out what that stands for. The third word is fat. Big, ugly, fat thing, okay? So I was kind of like embarrassed to be flying in it. And yet I had no choice because after I graduated from navigation school, the, the common practice was when the assignments would come in, if you graduated at the top of the class, you got the first pick of the operational assignment and aircraft type that you wanted. And the last guy, he got whatever was left over. So when people found out you were flying in a B-52, they just assumed that you were last in your class. But in fact, when I graduated from undergraduate navigator school in Mather Air Force Base, California, where your brother Jeff was born in 1968, uh, we, we, were, we were made familiar with a phrase that would later become all too commonplace, and that is, the needs of the Air Force come first. <laughs> and the needs of the Air Force when my class graduated was all of us needed to go to a B-52. So there we went. And there was no choice. And at that time, they were just beginning to put uh, a few navigators in the back seat of the F-4 Phantom. The F-4 had originally been designed as a two-pilot airplane, and that's why it had dual controls in it. It turned out that that was not a good idea in, in practice. I mean, it must have looked great on paper. But in, in reality, uh, pilots have a pretty large ego to start with. You have to have. To do what you do, you better have a big ego. You better have some swagger. You better have some uh, cojones. Or you should be selling ice cream, you know, but you shouldn't be flying an airplane. Thing of it is, you put two of those same kind of guys in the same <laughs> airplane and it's bad medicine <laughs> because they all are so headstrong, it's just not a good idea. And that's why when you go to a commercial airliner, there's the captain in the left seat, and there's a co-pilot in the right seat. And you cannot have two pilots in command. You can have one pilot in command. To have two guys trying to command the same airplane is a recipe for disaster. And really, putting two pilots in the F-4 was not a good practical operational idea. Because each, each ego would tend to clash. I mean, that's, it just wasn't a good idea. And they were running short of pilots. Couldn't, couldn't afford to put two pilots. So they started 
putting some navigators in the back seat of the F4. Well, for us guys who had been flying in the broom closet of a B-52, this was like dying and going to heaven. You had a window, it's called a canopy, and you had a stick and you had throttles. And uh, we understood that, you know, you needed to have a pilot in command. And so we never really conflicted with the guy in the front seat. And the guy in the front seat, turned out he's usually a pretty nice guy. Occasionally you would have some a-hole, every backseater would tell you, and they were former single seat fighter pilots who didn't want anybody in the airplane with them, especially a navigator, because they knew where they were before you got there. And so their instructions sometimes would be sit in, sit down, and shut up, and go cold mic. I got this. And they treated you like a suitcase, like you were just along for the ride. That's the exception rather than the rule, but it did exist. And then there were some guys like me who were just lucky, just plain lucky, because uh, my front seater was a guy named Paul Dombrowski. His, his nickname was, call sign was the Polish Eagle. And he had had a tour in Vietnam in the back seat of the F-4 as a lieutenant. And then he came back, and he went back for a second tour in the F-4 as the front seater. And he came back, and he was my front seater at Holloman. So when I started flying in Vietnam in the F-4, my front seater or accumulated over 500 missions. And uh, he, was, he was like a mentor to me, and he taught me how to fly the airplane, which was great. I ate that up. And when we deployed overseas and we're flying with our tanker for three days to get over there, he let me fly the airplane by hand up close to the tanker so I could practice flying my formation. And by the time I had three days, about 10 hours a day of practice, I was able to stay in formation with other airplanes. And later as we got over there and we started flying operational missions, uh, he, would, uh, he would actually let me, and under strict, and it was safe, but he let me do air refueling. And he was a good instructor. He, he wanted me to be able to fly the airplane in case something happened to him and we were to get hit or take fire or whatever. Neither one of us wanted to bail out over North Vietnam. That was not a good plan. And so he felt it was in his best interest that if anything happened to him that I could fly the airplane back home and we could bail out over friendly territory. In fact, he used to... Uh, as a routine, when we, we flew two missions a day when we were stationed at Tok Lee, Thailand. We would fly an outbound mission, and drop bombs, air refuel, drop bombs, land at Da Nang in Vietnam, stop for lunch, which was a candy bar and a Coke out of a vending machine, and we would take a short nap for about two hours while they were reloading our airplane with more bombs and refueling it. So then we would take off again and fly a second mission, hit another tanker, drop our bombs, and fly back to the west to Tok Lee. This made for about a 12-hour day and uh, a lot of flying. I remember one time I flew for 21 days straight without a break. And this is in the jungle. This is in the summertime. This is in the heat. But when we would come back to Tok Lee at night, uh, Paul would typically tell me to close my eyes. He says, we're about 50 miles out of the base. Close your eyes. And I'd close my eyes, and he would take the airplane and put it in some cockamamie. This is at night, by the way. He would take the airplane and pull the nose up, turn it over, do whatever he wanted to do, and he'd say, it's all yours. <laughs> and so 
I would open my eyes and it would be at nighttime and you couldn't tell up from down. And I had to look at the instruments and determine what her attitude was, what her airspeed was, what her altitude was. And my job was to simply recover the airplane into a wings level controlled flight situation. And that's all he wanted me to do. He didn't care if I could land the airplane or not. He wanted to have me be able to recover the airplane, fly it to a safe place, and you could bail the front seater out by twisting the control handle up here, and then you would pull your handle and the back seater goes out first, and then the front seater goes out automatically. Likewise, the front seater, if he pulls his handle, the back seater goes out first automatically, and then the front seater follows him shortly thereafter. So that's the way the ejection system worked. And that's, and Paul always treated me as a, uh, an equal. We were a team. I had my job to do, and he had his job to do. And together, we needed to be able to perform certain functions. And fortunately for me, one of the functions he wanted me to be able to do was to fly the airplane. And so uh, I did land the airplane a couple of times. Uh, he was always on the controls with me, and sometimes he had to make some <laughs> corrections for me. I, I could get her lined up, and I could be, like I said, you just drive it into the end of the runway. So if you get a straight-in approach and you don't have to do a, you know, a, a pitch out and a maneuver and a turn and all that, if, you, if you're on a GCA, ground control approach, and a long way out, if you set up your glide rate and you get lined up and it's not too windy, and if everything works out right, you just keep flying the airplane while it's sinking right at the end of the runway. And then when you feel the wheels touch down, you pull the throttles back. You know, it was under ideal conditions, uh, I could do a really sloppy job of landing the airplane. <laughs> and uh, I was very proud of that. And I was fortunate because not every backseater had, had somebody like that. Some of the backseaters got a, a brand new lieutenant right out of flight school. And those guys, nothing wrong with them, but they didn't have the experience and they needed the stick time. And so they got all the stick time and their backseater got none because they were still learning how to air refuel and fly formation and hone their skill level themselves. And so some backseaters just didn't get that opportunity. And I was one of the fortunate few that did. So uh, when I left Holloman, I got back from that TDY. That was six months. And uh, I was with the Black Sheep Squadron, best squadron you could ever ask to be in. I just came back a few weeks ago from San Antonio, Texas, from a Black Sheep reunion. They have one every year. And uh, our Vietnam experience was unique in that we went over as a unit and flew together. Most guys in Vietnam were there solo. You got assigned as an individual and you got on a commercial airliner and you flew over to the war and you were the new guy in the squadron. And there were guys who were coming home and there were guys who were coming in and it was always a state of flux, but it was a, a you know, it, it, was, it was a dynamic kind of a thing. And the difference was, we took our own airplanes over all together and we flew as a unit together and we came home and we came home and we never lost an airplane and we never lost a man, which was kind of phenomenal when you look at the odds of that happening. And our squadron commander was a great guy named Colonel, Colonel Don Hobart, the big yellow pumpkin. He was about six foot five and uh, a great guy, a wonderful squadron commander. And he had a meeting with the wives the day before we left. And he wanted to make sure that everybody was... We only had two days' notice. That April day in 1972, I got a phone call at about 4 o'clock in the morning, and they had what they call a recall roster, which meant that, in theory we were capable of going anywhere in the world at any time. All they had to do was to push the button and we would come into the base at any hour of the day and we practiced this like 
once every six weeks. And it was always a practice drill. We would come in, it was like, oh, it's another, another recall drill. Okay, we go in and you bring your shot record with you. And if you didn't have all your shots up to date, all your vaccinations for everywhere in the world, then you, the doc was right there and the people, and they gave the nurses, they gave you the shots. Then they checked your overseas bag. Well, you had to have every piece of equipment you would ever need for anywhere in the world. <laughs> And you had, so you had your deployment bag, you had your shot record, you were qualified to fly the airplane, and in theory, uh, you could leave that morning to go anywhere in the world. But something was different about this recall that morning because it turned out to be the real thing. It wasn't a practice. And they said, okay, thanks for coming in, guys. You got your shots, you got your stuff. Be back here in 48 hours because we really are going somewhere. So get your affairs in order. Get your checks going to the bank. Make sure your wife knows how to make the house payment and the car payment. Say goodbye to your kids. Take a couple of days off because in 48 hours, you're going to come back here and we really are going to go somewhere. And we didn't know where and we didn't know for how long. Well, we kind of knew where we were going. There was nowhere else to go in 1972 except Vietnam. So we, Annie and I took, uh, took a day off. And you know what we did? You went golfing. We went golfing up at that place in Cloudcroft. We went up and went golfing and stayed there for dinner. And we came home. And that was... The, my last day before I left for what turned out to be another six months. Hold that thought. Let's reset this again here. So, um, did you have any ideas when you were there, either in the B-52 or F-4, what, what kind of damage assessments would happen after a mission? Would they tell you, hey guys, you hit your target, you missed your target, or what was going on with that? Yeah, that was a, an intel function, the intelligence people. They took photographs before the strike and after the strike, and they had people who were qualified to do BDA, bomb damage assessment. And, uh, you know, Vietnam was uh, a unique kind of a war. I mean, I look at old World War II footage, and I see guys in airplanes strafing trains, and I see uh, other airplanes getting shot down and explosions blowing up all around you. Uh, yeah, there was some of that. Uh, the, first, the first time I ever flew a mission to North Vietnam, uh, the target was a, a Vietnamese regular army dining hall. They had a they had a training facility and they had a dining hall. And my, my flight, my group of airplanes, uh, we were supposed to drop a bomb at lunchtime in the dining hall. That was, that was our job. And so we got to see the film afterwards and we hit the dining hall and it was gone. Uh, I'll be honest with you, a lot of times we just dropped our bombs and our target was the ground somewhere in the jungle, in the vicinity of the Ho Chi Minh Trail. But you couldn't, with the technology we had then, uh, it was, if you were in the daytime, you might have a forward air controller mark a target with smoke, with white phosphorus rockets. And he would either say, hit my smoke, or, or hit you know 20 meters north of my smoke. And you were, in most cases, you were, you were not able to visually always pick up the target. But you had a reference point and you knew the target area. And if you were dropping napalm, that was probably close enough. Or if you were dropping CBU, cluster bomb units. Uh, but a lot of times, to be honest with you, you know, the guys flying over there were just trying to hit the ground. Because you didn't want to fly back with the bombs. You didn't want to land with bombs on the airplane. You had to get rid of them somewhere. And if you didn't have, if you arrived on the station, 
and the FAC didn't have any target for you, what are you going to do with those bombs? You're not going to drive them all the way back to your base and try to land with them. Oh no, you're going to drop them. And if you didn't have a good target, you dropped it hopefully somewhere away from the friendlies. And a B-52 at 30,000 feet, we did carpet bombing. And a lot of times, we, the crew members, didn't even have to decide when to drop the bombs. It was decided for us by the GCA controller who was painting us with radar. And he had been told through the ground channels where the targets were, the target box. So we flew three B-52s in formation, 500 feet separated in altitude, and about 500 feet off each wing. So we could lay down a string of bombs, each plane carrying 127 500 pound bombs times three, and we could either drop them on our own or we could be directed when to drop by the ground controllers. And we would lay a string of bombs about a half a mile long and about 1,000 to 1,500 feet wide. And anything in that box was destroyed. So that was a tactic that you used if you didn't have a specific pinpoint target. Wow, that's crazy. If you were flying at night in the F-4, and I, I remember very well one night when I was flying with the Polish Eagle. The good news about flying at night was we got to sleep during the day. And because we were trying to sleep during the day, there was only one hooch that was air conditioned. And so you couldn't sleep in the daytime if it was not air conditioned. It was just too hot. So we got the only air conditioned barracks on the base because we were flying at night and sleeping in the daytime. That was the only benefit to flying at night. Other than that, well, what also would made it easier was bomb damage assessment. You ask about feedback from your bombing mission. Uh, at night, when you hit something and, and the whole ground lit up, uh, you knew you had hit something. And one night, the Polish Eagle and I uh, were dropping f dumb bombs as opposed to smart bombs. We weren't, they weren't laser guided. They weren't GPS guided. There was no GPS system then. But we were throwing our bombs at the ground at night in a general area based on the forward air controller saying, you know, and, and at night you couldn't see smoke either. So he would lay a log. A, a burning log on the ground from his airplane. And then he'd say, okay, you see that light? You see my log hit so far to the southwest of it. So that's what you were bombing at, at night. It wasn't particularly accurate. So on this particular night, we hit something, and it must have been an ammunition stockpile depot or something because after we dropped our bombs and started our pull off you know you start your turn and you look back over your shoulder to see if you see anything to see if anybody's shooting at you to see if any if you hit anything or to just to watch your bombs go off you could see your bombs go off and this particular night man it looked like a county fair down there i mean we hit something and there was fireworks going everywhere and big balls of fire and orange. And uh, Paul, my pilot, was so excited because, to be honest, you know, 90% of the time we didn't hit nothing. But this was the 10%. And we hit the jackpot. And he got so excited. And Paul always carried a tape recorder, a cassette tape recorder with him. He liked to listen to music while we were flying and while we were bombing. The Polish Eagle, yes. He had a deep appreciation for music. And he liked classical music. And he liked to bomb with classical music playing through our headset. Not outside of the radio, but internally we're listening to classical music while we're dropping bombs. And when all the fireworks went off, he went crazy and started doing aileron rolls 
with the nose pointed up, listening to this classical music, my head was swimming. I didn't know which way we were going. Turns out he didn't either. <laughs> and we almost lost control of the airplane. <laughs> and he's hollering and whooping, and he's so excited that we finally hit something. We almost crashed because we were celebrating. <laughs> it was dark. It was night. It was, oh, oh, quite a, hey, are, you, are we going down or are we going up? You know, what are... We had to gain, regain control of the airplane. It was, yeah. How old were you that night? That night, I was born in 44, so I was 26 years old. Young and dumb and full of cum. Oh, excuse me, <laughs> my post-generations, but that's what we were back in those days. Man. All right, well, I'll pause it there. I got more than enough of what I was hoping to get. You can edit out the full account <laughs> thing if you want. <laughs> <laughs>